three days in the grave as, a man, as, as the bread of life with no sin in him. And then the first fruits, that literally on the day of first fruits, early in the morning, they would gather in a couple of pieces of, of the harvest, uh, bake a couple of, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, pull in a couple of these sheaves, and they would offer the first fruits of the, uh, of the harvest as a sacrifice. And Paul the Apostle says of Jesus, he is the first fruits of those born from among the dead. Now, it's interesting that we need to remember that there are cults out there, uh, particularly uh, the Jehovah Witnesses, that contain one of their arguments is that Jesus was created because he was born from among the dead. Um, and it sounds silly in context, but that's what a lot of the, a lot of people do. But him being born from among the dead isn't that he was created being, it's that he was raised, it means he was raised from, he was the first one that was raised from the dead. And just like him, we're going to be raised from the dead. Yeah. He was the first fruits of the harvest that would begin to come in at the Pentecost. Which is when the Holy Spirit came, started the church, and then moved forward. Now, what I say about these is that, the, that biblically speaking, all of these as feasts that God established again with Moses, 1,500 years, 1,600 years before Jesus, all of those were fulfilled in the first coming of Christ and the church to the day and to the moment. And could it be, if we're looking at patterns of seven, that the Day of Atonement, which represents what? Passover was an individual family atoning experience. You had to personally, you and your family, sacrifice this lamb, make a personal effort, you and your family, of faith, individually. But the Day of Atonement was when the high priest would once a year go in where? To the Holy of Holy Place. He would make atonement for the entire nation. Amazing. Paul the Apostle, the, dis or the, the prophets, what we talked about the last couple nights, uh, all say there'll come a day where the nation of Israel will receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Amen. That has not yet happened. But if indeed that's the purpose of that, is to atone for the national Israel, then, and, and, and the pattern is that four out of the seven have already been fulfilled to the day. Is it possible, I'm just saying, is it possible that the next moment of, of these, that it could be possible that the day of atonement could be the salvation of the nation of Israel as a, as, as a people that would receive Christ as their Messiah. Again, as we talked about last night, most of Israel is mostly atheistic or non-religious. Mm -hmm. uh, a very small portion of them are either Orthodox Jews or, or some other religion. Most of the people that live in Israel are, are not even religious in any sense. Just a thought. Day of Atonement. The Feast of Trumpets. I like this one. We're going to get to it. I'll get a little, a little bit more tomorrow night because the Feast of Trumpets is... It doesn't have a day or a beginning specific. Two people have to send out watch, look and see the old moon is waning, and the new moon has not yet come, and there could be, uh, we're waiting to see when when the new moon happens, and 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 me and Irene are out there, and we're, we're out there at night waiting, you know, as soon as the new moon comes, we can start this feast, right Irene? Yep, so we're looking. Do you see it? No, I don't see it. Do you see it? Oh, I see a little sliver. You see a sliver? Let me see. Oh, I see the sliver. You see the sliver? Two of us witness the sliver. Well, we're going to run and tell the high priest. The high priest is going to tell somebody, blow the trumpet and begin the Feast of Trumpet at the beginning and the first sight of the new moon. How many know that sometimes there can be a 48-hour period from the time of the old moon waning and the new moon coming? So, when... Jesus, when are you coming? And Jesus says, no man, tell us, what's, what, what, what is it? No man knows what? The day or the hour. Do you realize that that was a Jewish idiom referring to the Feast of Trumpets? It was, it was directly, it was like, you know, when we say, when Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour, it wasn't meant, hey, forget about it, don't figure it out. In saying no man knows the day or the hour, Jesus was literally giving us a clue from the Jewish idiom. When we say, hey, he kicked the bucket, what do we mean? He died, he died right? That means he kicked the bucket, right? I got through that by the skin of my teeth, right? You got, we know those. If somebody were to read those statements from us a thousand years from now, and we were to take it literally, it would be a little bit of a, the context would be a little bit funny. Right? Those of you that know a language or translate into English, you realize that you got to be real careful when you're translating and take an idiom of your culture. It doesn't really cross over very well. No man knows the day or the hour is one of those idioms that refers to the Feast of Trumpets. Mm. Just a thought. 
I'm just putting thoughts out there. At, at the last trump, right, when you hear the trump sound, then we will be changed in an instant, Paul says. And at the last trump, they'll be, they'll be there. So, um, anyway, I believe when Paul was talking about the trump, he was talking about the Feast of Trumpets. If, if, Jesus, if indeed Jesus has a connection to that. Um, not the trumpets from the book of Revelation. A lot of people go, well, all the rapture's got to be in the middle of the tribulation because the trumpets end, and then the, um, the bowls start to come, and then the, or the seals, and then the trumpets, and then the vials. So as soon as the trumpet, last trumpet sounds, so it's about halfway through, so the rapture's going to happen after the last trump in the book of Revelation. Just as a thought, what's wrong with that theory? Is that Paul died around 67 A.D.? Paul's the one that referenced the last trump. Paul, John the Apostle, the earliest he may have written Revelation would have been in the 90s to 95. A full 25 years before John wrote his book of Revelation. So the idea of a mid... I'm not saying that the mid-tribulation rapture is not possible. I'm saying using that verse and comparing it to the trumpets in Revelation is not a valid defense for the mid-tribulation rapture. So far, you follow that? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just saying. So then the Feast of Tabernacles, we said last night in the book of Revelation that Jesus, the Messiah, will reign on the earth for how long? A thousand, thousand years. years. God with us. His name will be called Emmanuel, the Bible says. God with us. Not just in our hearts. He will literally come from heaven and reign for a thousand years. So the Feast of Tabernacles, I believe, fits the pattern of the millennial reign of Christ. This fits the pattern of the Feast of Trumpets of the catching away of the saints. I'm not stuck to it. There's a lot of real smart people that believe since Pentecost has a lot of history, church began on Pentecost, that maybe the rapture would happen on a Pentecost. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not that smart. I'm just throwing out ideas. Um, and anyway, in the Day of Atonement, that, that the nation of Israel at some point will become uh, saved in the sense that they receive Christ as their Messiah on a national level. Okay? Anyway, that's all I can say about the churches unless we get farther. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Another seven. I will tomorrow morning. Huh? You <laughs> said I will tomorrow morning. Okay, after yeah, I'll have to my notes again. <laughs> oh, I want to throw out another really interesting pattern here that doesn't necessarily. Okay, so how many churches did John write letters to? Seven. Seven. How many churches did Paul write letters to? He wrote a lot of letters, but right. some of them were the same church. Yeah. Right. If you break it down, help me out here, right? So if you go in, the, if you read it right, Corinthians, Corinth, Galatia. Um, he wrote one to Ephesus too. I'm not that order because the Ephesians is the church of Ephesus, mm -hmm. right? Philippi. What else? I know there. I can just tell you there's seven, but let's. <coughs> Rome, electric Colossians. Yeah, and Romans. Romans to the Church of Rome. And one more. God. Yeah, Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Yeah. Interesting. He only he, all of his letters, which is two thirds of the New Testament, he still only wrote the seven. He wrote the individuals, but he wrote the seven churches. Just a neat, just a good little fact though. Fact word. Just a little fact word. Matthew 13. How are we doing? Oh. Matthew 13. There is a parallel. In Matthew 13, there are some parables. And it can be uh, construed in Matthew 13, the parables. There are seven parables in Matthew 13. And you can lay them out in the same order that you do these. Let's look. The first parable is the parable of the sower. And then the parable of the sower is like the parable of the wheat and tares. Parable of the mustard seed. Parable of the 
interesting, yeah, that, and, the, and, and that would be the third one. Let's go over here with the mustard seed. So the mustard seed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the mustard seed, um, uh, let me just, let me see, let me go back out here to Revelation, because there's just, just one really good example of, of uh, making these comparisons here. Um, <coughs> the church of Pergamos. terms of the unfolding of the um, the church of Pergamos, which was the unfaithful church, they were also the church during the same season that Christianity became legal, during his, his, the historical age of it, and they literally grew and blossomed into what Thyatira was, which would be one of the most corrupt areas of the church age, representing the, the massive corruption and the, and the political power of what became the Catholic church. Um, and so if you study those out, you'll, you'll recognize that. But the mustard seed started out small and then, of course, grew into a, a massive, massive thing. But anyway, the parable of the mustard seed, Matthew. And then the next one would be the parable of the leaven. And so the parable of the leaven and the church at Thyatira uh, have a lot in common. The sin getting needed into the entire body of the church to become a corrupt political institution in the public eye. <coughs> um, then the parable of hidden treasure. The parable of the pearl of great price. And then the parable of the dragnet, which is the last days. All these fish, pulling in the fish, last day's revival in the middle of uh, the world that we live. Again, these are just the outlying patterns that take a long time to go through these and make these comparisons. Something for you to do, uh, you know, as I go back for the cold weather. <laughs> you all can enjoy some time breaking these patterns down. Um, then, finally, at least seven raptures that the Bible talks about. There are seven, seven raptures at least. I use the word at least seven raptures that the Bible talks about. And I'll go over these, and then we'll hit these tomorrow night in our discussion. First one, uh, Enoch. The Bible says Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him, and he did not see death. Enoch. He was a type. He was a rapture. Enoch was the uh, seventh from God, by the way. Mm -hmm. Seventh from Adam, I mean. Seventh mm -hmm. from Adam. Mm -hmm. right? And he lived uh, 365 years. And then, I always liked that. You ever heard that? So, you know, God, he walked with God. So he, God would go walking every day, and they would walk and walk and walk. And, oh, got to go home, Lord. And next day, walk and walk and walk and walk with God. Oh, got to go home, Lord. And walk and walk and walk and walk with God, and then realizing, oh, you know what? You know, we're closer to my house than we are yours. Why <laughs> don't <laughs> just come over and stay a while? Yeah. You know, in intimacy, yeah. God just draws and say, yeah, let's stay the night. Let's have a let's have a sleepover. Well, is there a book of Enoch? There is a book of Enoch. There is, but whether or not it is not in the canon of Scripture. Right. However, it's quoted, I think, at least three times by uh, Jude, uh, James. Um, I, or Peter or one of the other apostles. It has three references. The Book of Jubilees has references in the Old Testament. And um, uh, so, yeah. So they use it. They reference it. So if the apostles are referencing it, it might give us a context of what their mindset was. The second session when we start talking about the, uh, the fate of the devil and, 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 and the fallen angels, we'll see what Peter says about fallen angels. Um, and where they are and where the devil is. We'll get through with this in a moment. I take us through the water break right here. But seven raptures. Enoch. I'm going to try to remember these by heart since I don't have my notes. 
Um, let's go with um, Enoch and then Elijah. Right? Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind and Elisha received his mantle. He never died. Elijah never died. Then um, Enoch and Elijah and then let's go with uh, trying to put these Elijah. I'm, I'm pretty sure we've got uh, Jesus. Jesus got ascended into heaven. Revelation chapter 12 actually used the word harpazo. He was caught up into heaven. He was snatched away. And it is what the Latin translates into rapture. So Jesus, though he ascended at the end of the gospel, in Revelation chapter 12 it references him being harpazo. So that is, and I'll go through that, how we get the word rapture, how rapture becomes part of our vocabulary, even though it's, rapture's not in the Bible. Well, I'll show you how we use it and how we got to that point. Then Paul, or Philip, right, Jesus here, and uh, Philip was harpazoed in the Greek. He was snatched away. When? When he sees the eunuch, he's running along. The eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah. He doesn't explain it. Philip explains it to him. And he sees some water and says, is there anything stopping me from getting baptized? No. Let's go down to the water. He goes down in the water immediately when he comes up. Then Philip was harpazoed away to Azotus, which means some city, which is, and actually the really cool image is it's halfway to his house, his home of Caesarea. It's not all the way home. Why would God only take him halfway home? Philip got snatched halfway home. He didn't go all the way to heaven. Maybe he just went to the sky. Maybe there's a pattern there that we can identify uh, with that. Philip, um, Paul the Apostle, I believe, if it was Paul in 2 Corinthians, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but I know a man who was caught up in heaven. Harpazo. It's, I'll, I'll explain it all tomorrow. This is just an overview of the sevens. <laughs> Um, Lord willing, but he was caught up into heaven and he said he saw things that he's not that no man should be allowed to speak of. Therefore he had a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble because of all of the revelation that he had seen while he was up in heaven. Oh, did you put Isaiah in there? I didn't give Isaiah yet. That's probably where my other one is. Yeah, huh? you missed one. Okay. Yeah. I knew there was another third one, so let's go with Enoch and then Isaiah chapter six. Let's go back. Isaiah Isaiah. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Why am I including that one? I'll explain it tomorrow. But pretty much, this goes beyond the vision experience for him because he touched, uh, he had a physical experience. Uh, I, yeah, in Isaiah chapter 6. He was caught up uh, into the very throne room of God. So Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, and then... Jesus, or... Uh, Enoch, Elijah, uh, Isaiah, Philip, Paul, Jesus. And then, that's six, right? Yeah, yeah. and then the church. The church. First Corinthians chapter 15 and First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll also that? show you... What, what scripture was that? First Corinthians 15 and First Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, around 17. Revelation 12. Revelation... Okay. You got all your notes, Sally. Yeah. She's got them down. I got my notes. And um, so we're going to go more into those tomorrow. This this will be a great breakdown of this. And I hope to show you. Sally and I were talking. She goes, you said you'd never say, you know. I didn't say she, you didn't say never. I, I said at the time. At the, well, at the time. Well, I'm just saying. Because <laughs> as I've studied more of the concept of the pre-tribulation rapture, I absolutely, personally, without a shadow of a doubt, I've come to a very strong conclusion that I believe strongly in the pre-tribulation rapture. If nobody believes in the pre-tribulation rapture, it's okay. We can still be friends. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's okay. I have people who come in all the time and we have great discussions. And I'm happy to listen to it. I have yet, I haven't really had any discussions of any information that I haven't been able to, to discuss yet. And, and just, there's one lady in particular who comes in and keeps throwing the mid-tribulation in, and I'm like, it's great dialogue. I'm not afraid to have dialogue as a pastor in front. I'm not afraid to learn something and challenge myself to say and go. Because when I began to speak on the book, on, on the end times, I'm like, I loved it. But I figured the best way I would learn is to start to dig into it and teach what I knew. I was afraid to teach end times at first. 
Because what if somebody comes in and they disagreed and I was nervous and I looked stupid because I didn't know exactly everything. I said, well, I'm the pastor anyway. Nobody can make me not be the pastor. I'm just going to go and I'm going to do it. So I dug it out and it started slow and I just cycled through this information. Yeah. And I believe that as I've studied it and been faithful and, and honestly listened to the voices of dialogue mm -hmm. in, in the Hebrew style versus the, the Greek style of just teaching and expounding, that I would have discussions and go, oh, that's interesting. Let's, let's look at that and study it out. I've done a lot of study every publicly, every Wednesday night for 10 years almost, 8 to 10 years having a dialogue with multiple different people that would come and go uh, identifying these patterns, studying this information, not doing research. Um, I'm not nervous if somebody has an opposing opinion. I'm not nervous if somebody says something about the Bible that I may not have a handle on, yet they've learned something. I'm happy, you know, um, to discuss it, you know. It doesn't bother me. Whatever we can do to become more equipped as the body yes. of Christ. Yes. Isn't that right? So, Anyway, so seven rafters. There we go. There's my seven. Maybe eight. And maybe eight. There's probably a lot more. Um, and then, but also, if you have a challenge with the rapture as a doctrine, think about it like this. Do you believe in the resurrection? At the very least? Mm -hmm. Somebody who says, there's no rapture. Well, then ask them, do you believe in the resurrection? Because Paul equates the moment of resurrection with the rapture. <laughs> yep. the, the dead will rise first, and in twink of eye, those of us that are still alive will go. You know why the dead have why the dead go first? They have six more feet to go than we do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm catch it on. Okay. Anyway, I'm gonna take a drink of water and go. Does anybody have any? It's a good.